It's a real joy to be back in Heidelberg and uh, to be with you in the Bible Fellowship this morning. And uh, can I just say that um, your, your open door and open hearts, I know this will probably be reiterated at a later stage, but to Upward Bound, I know is greatly appreciated. Um, and it was commented on on many occasions just how such a blessing that uh, that this this venue was for the upward browners, and uh, there were three Irish that came over that I knew, and uh, so we got a photograph at the sign at the front where it said "Welcome to the Upward Browners." Um, so thank you for that that welcome. really been just before the Lord for a message for you this morning, and um, it's one of those messages that maybe is not going to be very easy to deliver, and it might not be that easy to receive either. <laughs> That's got you really nervous already, hasn't it? Um, But I guess that when we, when, you know, I don't know where you are this morning, and maybe you've come in this morning, and actually, the very thought of worshiping the Lord is miles away. Maybe, maybe because of circumstances in life, maybe just because of what's going on. I, I just really pray that, that when we come to the end of this brief time that we have together this morning, that the Holy Spirit will do his work in our lives and that we will, at the end of this time, worship the Lord for who he really is and what he can really do for us. The Sea of Galilee um, is about, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an uh, imperial because I'm from Ireland, but it's about 13 miles um, long and about six miles wide Surrounded by mountains all around, and uh, I have look, I've actually got my myself into trouble um, because the upward bounders are always at me. When are you going to go on the camping trip? When are you going to go on the camping trip? And I made the mistake on uh, I don't know what night it was. Was it last night? I said, "Well, I haven't gone yet." <laughs> I was reminded of that this morning at just after six when they were all getting ready to leave. Um, and one guy had a fishing rod with him. He was taking the fishing rod. I said, well, I hope you catch more than the cold. And uh, he, he hoped that he would. But the fishing around Galilee was excellent. And actually, the Lord Jesus spent a lot of his time around Galilee. 19 of the 32 parables were spoken around Galilee. 25 of the 33 miracles happened around Galilee. It was, a, it was obviously a strange sort of a place. There, there obviously was a very uh, different accent. You know, you remember you were trying to understand my accent today. But there was a, an accent that came with that region, like many, like, just like many countries have various areas that, that have strong accents. That, that's what it was like. If you remember when, when Peter was denying the Lord, he was reminded, ah, but your, your voice, you're, you're one of his followers because your accent, your voice betrays you. Yeah. And we could think about many different things. If you think of the 25 miracles, you know, we could go through loads of them. But there's one in particular that I want us to read the text of this morning. And um, if you want a title, if you want a title for this morning's this morning's message, it's this, making headway painfully. Making headway painfully. Let's turn to the scriptures, please, to Mark's gospel, chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat 
and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up onto the mountain to pray. And when the evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your living, inspired word. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will open these verses to us this morning, that we may be encouraged, blessed, challenged, and ultimately that we may be drawn to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Making headway painfully. Maybe that could describe your life this morning. Or maybe you would say, well, actually, Sam, I'm not making headway at all. I actually feel like I'm going backwards. The, the wind is so much in my face this morning that I feel I'm in reverse, that I'm, I'm not actually gaining any ground at all. Some of the things that come into life can suddenly come in. We don't see them coming, and suddenly they arrive Business situations. We don't know will we get through the, the next stage of business and what's going on in, in our business life or our work life. I was in business for 20 years and it was some of the most difficult times of my life. Or it may be family situations. Circumstances in family that that actually we wonder, will there ever be a solution? We were thinking something about this the other night when we thought about Joseph and, and what happened to him. And yet the many years later that, that he entered into forgiveness of his brothers, and he could say, you know what? God's been working this all out all along. Or maybe there's just stuff going on in our personal life that actually we... Nobody else, maybe even our partner in life, doesn't fully comprehend or get what's going on inside my life at this moment in time. Or church life. My goodness, um, I'm an elder, inverted commas. Fellow elders, I know. Some of the weightiest pressures of life are not always your home family, your business, your employment. But often it's the flock that's under your care. And it causes many a sleepless night. Many a question, yet you fire to the Lord. Quite often, a lot of the storms in life, it's all around relationship, isn't it? A lot of it is all around relationship. Relationships that are broken. 
Here were a group of disciples. And in this chapter, the Lord has just sent out the twelve. John the Baptist has just been beheaded. And he had actually said to the disciples, you need, to, you need to come apart a while and you need to rest. You need to take some time out to rest and to be still. And we often use this, this passage here as a prerequisite to take time out to rest, to get away from people, to get away from programs, to get away from all that's going on in life, and just to be still before the Lord. And that is so needed. And... Um, but I want you to notice, just come back to, to verse 30 here as, as we come into this. Um, verse 31, And he said to them, Come apart by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. There was that many people de demanding from them. They didn't have time to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. You think, that's great. They're getting some time away. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They were trying to get away for rest, but the crowd got ahead of them, got one up on them, and got the place they were going to rest, they arrived. Oh my goodness, here's the crowd again. A distraction from, from a period of rest. That's a, a, a separate thing. So they, they come out of this being taught about rest and of this thing, the feeding of the 5,000. And the Lord says, I want you to get into the boat. I want you to get into the boat. And that's, that's exactly what they did. They were given an instruction, get into the boat and, and head across the other side. The King James says, he constrained them to get into the boat and to go to the other side. Here it says, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Quite often when we are in the midst of a storm, we actually, we, we don't see the Lord in it. There's some storms of life that can be brought on just by ourselves, by foolish decisions and things that we do. And as difficult as it is to say, there are some storms in life and actually the Lord permits them. And in this occasion and in this particular storm, the Lord brought them into the boat, told them to get into the boat, head to the other side, and he told the crowd to go. And after they set sail, the Lord removed himself and went up to a mountain to pray. What sort of a situation did these disciples find themselves in? Well, they first of all find themselves out on the sea. In the King James it says, in the midst of the sea. If you think about that, in the midst of the sea, that gives the sort of thinking that they were the furthest place from the shore. They were right in the middle of the sea. The shore was, you know, so Potentially, they were in the middle of Galilee. It was three miles that way, and it was three miles that way, and it was six and a half miles that way. It was six and a half miles that way. There was no easy get out here. It seems to me they were in the most dangerous place in the midst of the sea. And when were they there? It says that they were, they were there, and it was in the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch of the night is between three o'clock and six o'clock in the morning. My, my, my wife back home, um, she's not the best of a sleeper. Yeah? So, I, you know, there could be washing left downstairs, and in the morning when you come down, the washing's done, or the ironing's done. But she would say to me, the longest hours are just those hours. Once you get between three o'clock and six, it's just like it's the night's never going to end. This seems to be a point of deep, deep darkness for the disciples. Now, 
Uh, I, I know some of you have been there. It seems to be the most dangerous place. There's no way to get rescue. The darkness is so intense, there just doesn't seem to be any light. Where they were, when they were, what they were doing. They were making headway painfully. They were just seeking to get through life. Don't know, we don't know what the conversations were between them. But it seemed that every hour and every minute was a struggle. It seemed like it was never going to end. Maybe they knew the Lord said, you've got to go to the other side. And they're doing their best to get to the other side. And they're rowing and they're, they're battling through And it seemed like everything was against them. The wind was against them. And so often in life, and different stages in life, we can feel that the wind is just in our face constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. This for these disciples was a real valley in life. You think of what happened beforehand. You had, a, you had the feeding of the 5,000 and 5,000 people were fed and women and children on top of that. And then you think of what happened after they got come out of the storm, it, it, the healing of the, the, the demonic at, at, at uh, Gennesaret. Two mountaintop experiences, but right in the middle of this, there is this deep, deep valley that these disciples are going through. It just seemed that the problem they were facing was never going to end, and nothing was going to change it. So where was the Lord when all this was going on? Did you, ever, did you ever cry out, Lord, where are you? Lord, you, you need to reveal yourself to me here. Because there's stuff going on, I can't handle it. I can't deal with it anymore. Lord, where are you in this? I want you to think about the Lord's praying. It doesn't say specifically that he was praying for the disciples in, in what they were going through. But I, I just take from the text, it actually, it tells us here, and we'll come to this in a minute, he saw them making headway painfully. Do you think the Lord that we've been just singing about, the one who was on his way to the cross to die, to suffer for you and for me, do you think he was sitting on the mountain alone and aloft from everything that the disciples who had followed him for these years were, were going through down below, and even though he saw them, he just... Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Writer of the Hebrews says this. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. He 
he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. You know, I want you to think about this. In the middle of this storm, the disciples couldn't see Jesus. And this morning, you and I can't physically see Jesus. Is it a stretch of the imagination that the Lord was on the mountain and he was offering up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears for the disciples in the storm? Because he saw them making headway painfully. Brothers and sisters, this morning, Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you. In the midst of everything that's going on, remember Remember, he marks the sparrow that falls. He numbers, he has every hair on your head numbered. I think the scripture, scripture is, is amazing, you know. It's not that every head on your hair is, count, is counted, but actually every hair has a number. So, so those of you who are like me, getting old, and the hair is disappearing, and we do a close shave to make sure it's, a, you know, he, he knows exactly what number falls out. And we, we are talking about the all-knowing God here. And he sees you making headway painfully. Excuse me. Sorry to the sound, guys. This is where I want to get to. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. He came to them walking on the sea, walking on the waves, the waves that were causing them so much trouble and anxiety. He comes walking on the top of those waves, but he comes to them in the midst of the darkest hour. There's a particular circumstance in life. And I was asking the Lord, where are you? What is going on? And he came. He came as I drove my car in through the church gate in Enniskillen. And he came through the words of a song To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley. He will lead. Oh, the night has been long, but I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Oh, oh, 
that whatever is going on in your life, did you experience Christ coming to you this morning? In all of his power, walking on the sea. Might not answer all the questions. I've still got loads of questions in my mind. But Christ came. Christ came. His presence was a reality to the disciples. They were afraid. It scared the life out of them. They were frightened. And he said, take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And then he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased. The Lord had the power to calm both the cause and the effect. I put it to you that when the disciples came out of this storm, they were never the same. Storms change our lives. I didn't get an answer to the storm that I faced four years ago until this week. And after one of the sessions in the room up here, someone came to me who was going through exactly, exactly the same storm. And I was able to hug that person and just say, I know how you feel. I want you to notice that in every three occasions that this storm is mentioned in the Gospels, it's mentioned by three writers, excuse me, it's mentioned by Matthew, it's mentioned by Mark, and it's mentioned by John. And every single one of the writers Refer to the Lord as Jesus. Not as Lord, not as Christ, but Jesus. And Jesus is his earthly name. The name that was given him, and he shall save his people from their sins. And we're reminded in Hebrews again that the Lord is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Because as Jesus, he was a man who experienced storms and rejection and difficulties in life and ultimately faced the storm of all storms when he took all the brokenness and sin and mess up and death of this world upon himself that you and I might have hope in him, might have everlasting life, might have peace in him. In all three of the rec records of this particular storm, it describes the ending in Mark's gospel that we were at, it says they were utterly astounded. It was like, goodness me, look just what happened. In John's gospel, it says that they, as soon as they received him into the sheep, ship, 
Immediately they were at land. They had arrived. But Matthew says, the wind ceased. And they worshipped. The wind ceased. And they worshipped. put it to you that after what the disciples had just experienced this wasn't fake worship they had just realized who it was they were following who it was that had just calmed the storm in their lives and they worshipped him One of the most difficult things to do in the midst of a storm is to worship the Lord. I shared this with um, the Upward Binders last week. During that period of life that I've been referring to, there's one night I just said, I'm not going out to the prayer meeting tonight said to my wife, Louise, I'm just going to stay at home. I just can't take much more. I had enough. And away she went. She went to the prayer meeting. She got into the car, and uh, she's got Spotify, and they're all connected to the car. And On came a song. You're going to realize now that songs are very important in my life. <laughs> on came a song. And she went to the prayer meeting, listened to a number of other songs in the way, and it takes about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to go to where we meet. And she came out of the prayer meeting, she got into the car, and the car started up, and the same song comes straight on again, which is unusual. And I was sitting at home, and she walked in the door, and she said, Sam, get up on your feet. We're going to worship. The music was turned up full blast in the kitchen. You might think this is a bit radical, but we danced around the island as we sang. I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. Brothers and sisters, there's power in worshiping God in the middle of the storm. Paul and Silas got that. And in the midst of the storm, not only does his presence come, but his voice comes sometimes. That's what happened here. It, It says he spoke to them. He spoke to them. Read the text. I think it it would be worth it. Whenever you go back home, read through this passage again and just look at what he does. He made. He went up. He saw. He came. He spoke. He got into the boat. And he spoke. He spoke to me in that storm as well. He spoke to me through Psalm 28 and verse 7. Maybe this verse is for someone in this place today. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped My heart exalts with praise. As we come soon to remember the storm of all storms 
as we partake of bread, and as we partake of the, the cup to remember what Jesus Christ endured at the cross for us. May our hearts be lifted, and I know it's hard, may our hearts be lifted above the storms of life to give thanks to the one who went through the wrath of God on Calvary's cross, resurrected, that he might eventually bring us into a new kingdom, a new heaven, and a new earth, where there's no pain, and there's no sorrow, and there's no storms, and there's peace forevermore. That's the Jesus I trust today with my whole heart. What about you? Maybe there's someone here this morning and actually you don't know Jesus today. You're in a storm. Will I tell you? He wants to bring you peace. He wants to bring you peace. You can receive him this morning. Receive him into your vessel, into your boat, as it were. To forgive you, to cleanse you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold you fast this morning. He will hold you fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. May God bless his word right into the inner depths of our being and hearts this morning as we worship him. Let's just pray. Holy Spirit, we pray to come and minister into the hearts of those that are here this morning that are in the midst of the storm. Lord, we pray, come and presence yourself Come and speak. And we pray this morning that as that happens, that it will cause our hearts to respond in worship. We thank you. We thank you for who you are, for what you have done. And we pray your blessing upon each head bowed as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.